please, what is that? Don't tell me. It's all in the reflexes. You're listening to All in the Reflexes, an unrepentant vivisection of geek news and culture. It's all in the reflexes. With the comedy rock geek Mikey Mason, the Brack of all trades, Jeb Brack, Madison Matricula Roberts, and Tech Guy Steve. I know there's a problem with your face. Hello and welcome to All in the Reflexes. I'm Jeb Brack. I'm Madison Matricula Roberts. And this is Tech Guy Steve. And it's been a lovely little vacation, but we're back. We're back on the mics. It's good to hear from you all, and it's good to be with you guys as well. Before we get started, I do have one announcement. Along with friend of the show, Jason Brick, uh, he uh, he is the creator of a series of RPG books called Random Encounters, which are available on Amazon.com. Uh, we are restarting his Random Encounters RPG discussion group. Uh, there's a group on Facebook that you can join, and each week we're going to put up a couple of thought-provoking RPG questions, get thoughts from experienced role players, and then we take the best of that discussion, we distill it, and we're going to be putting out an essay about the topic at hand. So maybe we'll talk about orcs. You know, what is what is an orc to you? What What are ways that you can handle the race of orcs in an RPG? And so if you want to have uh, some input on, into that, we could use your advice. So look look us up on Facebook, the Random Encounters public group, and uh, I hope to be speaking with a bunch of you soon about that. Have we got any other announcements? Yeah, I just want to point out that we picked up a couple new Patreons over at Patreon.com, and uh, one of them increased his pledge level, and so we, we pushed our um, you know, monthly contributions to twenty dollars a month. Which hey. was one of our, Woo! yeah, it was pretty cool. It's one of our thresholds because that's about what we pay for web hosting. Um, and, and I think we said it before, you know, it's not like we're making any money on this stuff. Um, Patreon just helps offset uh, what we what we pay out of our pocket um, to host the, the web content. Um, so thank you, thank you very much for the Patreon, uh, our patrons, and um, you know they help make this whole thing possible for everybody. So you know, thank you to our listeners in general, and especially thank you for the few who um, helped chip in to cover that cost. Thanks so Yay. much. And now on a personal note, I finished my novel. Congratulations! Um, ten that is years huge. ago. Ten years ago, I started work. I came up with this idea and started working on it. I didn't work on it for the full ten years continuously, but you know, I'd tinker with it. I'd put it away. I'd get to, you know, I'd bring it out and write on it, and then I'd get all discouraged and I'd put it away. Well, this year is the year. I promised I was going to finish it for myself. I did it. It's out to beta readers right now, and when I get back their feedback, I'll give it a, another run through the word processor, and then I'm sending it out to agents and publishers and whatnot and possibly even considering self-publishing. But So I'll keep you advised as that goes along. How's it going for you guys? What's up? Well, first, that is so exciting. For me, I finished a smaller project. I, uh, Illogicon, my home con that I help run, is now Illogic Complete. We had a ah. very successful weekend. I've been, I've been, I'm really, I've been storing that one up. <laughs> but... In more recent news, uh, I actually filled in as a live art model for a figure drawing class. The uh, The original person canceled, so one of my friends who does the booking called me about like two, three hours before the event and was like, oh my gosh, can you, are you available to do this? And I'm like, yes. And she's like, well, they would love it if you'd wear the clown makeup. And I'm like, okay, Ooh. I can do that too. But I, I got there and um, nothing was creepy or anything, but they were expecting a burlesque model. <laughs> um, in burlesque attire that they had been um, promoting. And they were fine that they knew that I was coming in clown makeup and stuff, but uh, I'll, maybe I can talk more about this on the uh, the other show, There's a Problem With Your Face. But I had to, like, go all... And they weren't creepy about it at all, but they are like, you know, any skin that you're comfortable showing, we'd really appreciate it. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. So I, I went all Jamie Lee Curtis and True Lies to kind of sex up my outfit. And uh, I got very creative with some scissors, and uh, I'm very proud of myself. But the experience was wonderful overall. Um, it was just, you uh, think it wasn't boring to just kind of sit perfectly still in one spot. Uh, it is. I just kept going through all of my songs in my head cause I'm always trying to keep them memorized, mm. but I'm not, I am, I'm 
overweight. Um, I'm not self-conscious about my weight, but I, I am overweight. But I was sitting there, and it's, like, all on my little, like, fluffy rolls. And I'm like, I'm a buttery little croissant. This is great. It's all hot. <laughs> I'm like, I'm into this. So, But that's uh, that was really cool. That was a couple days ago. So I hope they book me again because it was really fun. That well, is then cool. Let me be the first to offer my illogic congratulations. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> oh, it's so good. That is so funny. Steve, how about you? Uh, so I was creeping about the snow from a couple weeks ago, and we've had um, really surprisingly warm weather, like in the 50s. And so everything melted, and then it would get a little chilly, then it warms up again, and it, it's just weirdly warm January. Um, we've, we've had warm Januarys before in New England, and then you get hammered in February, so, you know, whatever. I don't know. <laughs> Personally, I've been watching this series on Amazon Prime Video called Philip K. Dick's Electric Dreams. It's I've like, heard of that. Yeah, uh, 10 episodes. It's a little bit in line with, um, I want to say, um, Twilight Zone or um, Black Mirror, uh, Outer Limits. Okay. It, it's They're sci-fi. They're supposedly based on his short stories. I don't think every episode is, and I don't know how close. I haven't read all of his short stories before. And so a lot of it has to do with, with the normal Philip K. Dick themes of identity, um, memory, how do you know you really are who you think you are, you know, how do you know the people around you are, are really what they think, you know, what they claim to be, etc. Some of them are much better than others. Some of them are, are just, there, there's one of them, with, they have a great cast, by the way, every one has, has really good actors. There's one with Steve Buscemi, yeah. and I, it makes zero sense. I mean, from the beginning <laughs> to the end, like, no part of this makes sense. Um, and, and it's not like the overarching plot is fine. It reminds me, I, I guess it's heavily based on, um, Double Indemnity, a famous kind of noir film, yeah, murder sure. mystery. Um, so yeah. this is you know, f- you know far future crazy sci fi setting, but it's basically that plot. Except that there's a bunch of stuff that happens in the background of this episode that is never explained, and it, I don't know what to say. You just watch this like, but why? <laughs> why did you make a point to put that in here and not say anything about it? Um, I- I'll just share one very brief one. <laughs> they get vegetables from like a vegetable pur- purveyor. And the vegetables artificially age and rot quickly. And it's not just vegetables. They even have things like, um, eggs. And like the wife pulls the eggs out of the, out of the, you know, refrigerator and they're already black and ruined and have to be fed into this garbage disposal. And it, the time on the everything keeps getting shorter. So some of the food is rotting the same day it's delivered. Hmm. And I'm like, okay, why? Yeah. What does this mean? Is it genetically <laughs> engineered? Is there a disease? Is there some environmental factor? Like they make a big point of showing you this in the episode, but unless I fell asleep during this section, I didn't see any explanation <laughs> for what or why or what it means or why they would include it. It's no, just bizarre. No payoff? No like weird commentary no. on planned obsolescence or nothing? No, that's like exactly that? what I thought, that the, where it was going, but they never mention it. So <laughs> the other ones are much better. The other episodes are much, much better. Some of them are very, very good. That one is just a total head scratch. Or so. <laughs> well, you know, nine out of ten ain't bad. <laughs> All right. Well, it's good to hear from everybody. So uh, let, let's dive into it. Let's get to the news. And now for some more bad news. Ready? Well, we have a couple in memoriams this week. Uh, Dolores O'Riordan, the lead singer of the Cranberries, is dead at 46, just 46 years old. Very young. Yeah, her uh, death was announced by her publicist. And the the thing that's amazing, she was in London recording, actually, again. Uh, she, has, she has passed. I, I just want to comment, as a female singer-songwriter, like, it, you hear her voice, and it's so immediately recognizable and distinctive. Yes, um, yep. And I, I was reading, I think she, she wrote Linger at, like, 17 or something. Uh, it was just amazing. Um, but uh, hats off uh, to her family in solidarity. Uh, and also, in other, like, big influence to me personal personally news, Ursula K. Le Guin has died at 88 years old. And um, may we all live a life with uh, as few flips as she had to give about uh, <laughs> the way things should be. Uh, she's a, a famous fantasy author, particularly for the Left Hand of Darkness and the Earth Sea series. Uh, one of her one of her books that was it's my absolute favorite book, and I still reread it every few years is The Dispossessed, which takes place in the same timeline as Left Hand of Darkness, but in the the past of that world. But um, just what an influential writer uh, to so many people. So, yeah, I, I'd heard of her. I don't think I've read her books, but I've certainly. 
um, read stuff that was inspired by her and lots of discussion about her life and career, you know, long after those books were published. So we mourn their passing and now we hear not getting to death, but career death sort of by choice. <laughs> we want to specify <laughs> these people aren't dead. No, <laughs> yeah, no, right. no, yeah. I just thought it was weird that within the span of like a week or two, um, at least three really big uh, musical acts have decided to stop touring or playing in public. One is Elton John, says he's quitting after 50 years of performing, um, so like uh, over 200 shows. Anyways, like, everybody loves Elton John, but uh, Neil Diamond, this is sad. He said he announces he was, his retirement from concert touring after uh, Parkinson's diagnosis. Mm. Um, which again, very sad. He's another one of these people that just keeps performing. You can fill a uh, a room decade after decade after decade. And then I don't know if, if Mikey, so she has a, a view on this, but Leonard Skinner announces the, the last Street Survivors farewell <laughs> tour. I wonder if people are going to finally stop asking for uh, Freebird. Uh, that Freebird, song. thank you. People, people will never stop. Uh, and, nope. and it's a double-edged sword for Mikey in particular because he, he took a hard line on it. And so many people think they're so funny. Yep. They just, people are little, they just think it's so funny to, to do and to hassle him in particular about it. And it's like, <laughs> there's a part of me that's like, oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, guys. That yeah. That's what you gave to performers everywhere, and now nobody's even going to be asking you guys to play it anymore. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, FYI, never yell Freebird. It's not funny. It's really yeah. annoying. It's 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 a problem. It's you're not you're not in an in joke. Just yeah, just it is a joke that has long since jumped the shark. Yeah, <laughs> I gotta say, the, all these announcements coming so close together kind of feels like um, you know, what do you call it, a turning of the guard, mm. kind of the, the old guard yeah. of music. These kind of evergreen acts. Um, are, are stepping back and, you know, time for new well, acts to step up. Yeah, it had to happen sometime. I mean, even the Rolling Stones are going to have to stop at some point. But uh, that that day is not today. So let me say this. The White House often borrows works of art from museums, you know? Uh, yeah, I think the, it's a, a long tradition of that, isn't there? Yeah, yeah, there there absolutely is. Um you know, Obama. The Obamas asked for uh, some artwork that uh, that they that they had hung up. Um, the Kennedys, um, many others. The long long tradition of, and that's one of the ways that our country uh, kind of pays tribute to the arts. Uh, but when the Trump White House asked to borrow a Van Gogh from the Guggenheim. Uh, they not only said no, but they offered a, they, they did a no, but, uh, <laughs> and I, but is in a big way because instead they offered a fully functioning 18 carat solid gold toilet, yeah. which, <laughs> which was an art installation that they, they had that has, uh, reached the end of its display period. And so they, that's what they offered in, in respectful pro, respectful protest. Yeah, no, it is a real piece of art. Yeah, yeah, yeah it certainly is. It certainly and, is. And we know, uh, we know, Trump does value um, gold, gold and, decor, and gold. Yeah, so I mean, it's it's, it's not necessarily not apropos. It's true. Um, Although he is also famously a germaphobe, so because yeah. this this <laughs> toilet in the Guggenheim <laughs> was available for use by the public, it wasn't just on display. It was a fully functioning working toilet in a bathroom. Hard guarded by a security guard and people would line up to use this toilet at the Guggenheim as part of the interactive all you know and then every 15 minutes they'd come by and they'd wipe it with special wipes so that you know you wouldn't shave off pieces of the toilet seat and take them home or whatever Uh, (laughs) so there you go you know I don't know art but I know what I like and uh, well well, there you go (laughs) well y'all know what I like I like monkeys. And, yeah, everybody loves monkeys. Yeah, and Chinese scientists have cloned the first successful healthy monkeys. This is the first time that they've successfully cloned primates. Uh, and these were cloned from um, from monkey oh. fetuses, uh, which is a oh, little different I, from uh, – everybody remembers Dolly the Sheep. Yeah, um, but I, I, think I, I think I saw this movie. Um, <laughs> how long is it before there are overlords, or do they give us the rage virus? I can't remember. Yeah. <laughs> uh, no, but it's really interesting. So they, they say that 
So some of the stuff, so they cloned Dolly, uh, the sheep from an adult sheep. So that was like super exciting. But, uh, again, like her, her lifespan was affected by that. But anyway, so their, their goal, uh, right now it's super inefficient to clone these monkeys because it took like a hundred and some fetuses to get like two two mm-hmm. healthy cloned monkeys but the goal is not necessarily to apply this technology to humans so they say uh, <laughs> yeah but, right but to create lots of genetically identical monkeys for use in medical research which is similar yeah. to what they do with mice and stuff so um yeah i thought it, the, the, one of the interesting things about the article was uh dolly was back in 1996 like <laughs> that is what uh, uh 21 years ago yeah wow that's crazy that we've been you know cloning mammals for you know over two decades. Well, and then fighting about it too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think I think that probably a lot of the a lot of the debate that's going on slowed down that the pace of that research somewhat. Mm-hmm. Since uh, there'd be plenty of scientists who didn't want to get mixed up in that particular strand of DNA. Yeah. So. Uh-huh. Well, talk about uh, mix up. I don't. I don't. I'll just read the headline. I don't have an opinion on this. It's so far out of my uh, ballywick here. But they decided to remake West Side Story. Yes. Kind of the the hippest, craziest dancing a gang fight I've ever seen on TV. But it's that's right. Steven Spielberg. Steven Spielberg is remaking it. And they're they're put not a casting call. I mean they're they're going for the leads. I mean it's it's a serious thing. Ha. Huh. So I'm you in, know that's I'm a in. thing. Well, I mean, has Steven Spielberg ever made a musical before? I don't believe I, that he has. I, I can't pull one out of my yeah, out of my yeah, head. It's still yeah, going so, to be a musical, right? And <laughs> it's gonna be a gritty reimagining. Where they take I mean the it's music pretty out. gritty. Uh, once you take out the dancing, I mean it's it's kind that's of right. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. <laughs> but, Isn't it uh, just a retelling of Romeo and Juliet, though? Mm-hmm. It is. It's a it's a reworking of Romeo and Juliet. Um, but like but, what uh, in New York and with mm-hmm. games. Mm-hmm. And... It'll be interesting to see if uh, they if he puts it, you know, in the fifties where the musical is set, or right. if he or tries to it. update it. But uh, you know, if he's never made a musical, probably this is something he is looking to check off his to do list. You know, yeah, kind of director's budget li- uh, bucket list. Yeah, exactly right. Well, I've done blockbusters. I've changed the face of movies. I've redefined everyone's childhood. I think it's time to do musicals. And so, what better one yeah, than the yeah, iconic? Right. <laughs> Hopefully they won't have uh, anybody in um, brown face to play Puerto Ricans. In this oh, one, man. But, yeah, that's right. Uh, uh, <laughs> I don't know. The way Hollywood goes, it's like. Uh... Yeah, yeah, it's true. That's true. Uh, but I think that if that happens, somebody would get up and throw a stool at their heads. So like they did in North, in uh, South Carolina to this poor comic. <laughs> We've got uh, this video that's going around of Whew. a guy doing a stand-up comedy routine in Columbia, South Carolina at the comedy house. His name is Steve Brown. And evidently he addressed uh, a member of the audience who attacked him. I mean, and from what I understand, it wasn't particularly, you know, nasty, uh, heckling from the stage or, you know, ribbing from the stage or anything. It was just he had dressed the guy, and the guy got up, threw the mic stand at him, threw the stool at him, threw punches. Uh, yeah, and it, was, then, it was crazy. Yeah, this video, uh, you have to, we'll have to, we'll have to post it in the, in the group maybe too. It's, it's, yeah, brutal. I, I have seen video on YouTube of, um, like drunk patrons try to get up on stage or, or wobble sure. around and somebody would throw a drunken punch missed by a mile. This Fall was down. Yeah, this was <laughs> not, this guy came after he was swinging the, the, the metal mic stand. Yep. He was hitting other on like audience members. Yeah. Um, by accident. Was I, he assault, wasn't really, man. yeah, he wasn't really aiming at them. He hurt more people in the audience than, than yeah. the guy he was aiming at. But, uh, mostly minor injuries and, and, and all that. But, Boy, what's, it, just, uh, it just goes to show you that comedy is serious business. Yeah. <laughs> 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 I, I, oh, my God. <laughs> moving on. Moving on. Uh, <laughs> moving on. So, it's, uh, West Side Story, okay, I, I guess. But they're bringing back Murphy Brown. They're bringing back Murphy Brown with Why? Candace Bergen. Uh. And we, we have the tweet from Mark Noller. Um, uh, CBS announces it's bringing Murphy Brown back to TV with Candace Bergen, reprising her role 
Uh, and CBS is ordering 13 new episodes to air in the fall, 30 years after its debut. Yeah, but it was such a quintessentially, you know, late 80s, early yes. 90s kind of a kind of a phenomenon. I mean, that, uh, exactly. Did you, it was you remember watching its it at time. all? Sure, I do. Sure, I so do. So did I. I yeah. also, do, do you remember when, um, what was it, uh, <laughs> was it Al Gore's wife who mentioned it? Oh, yes. Um, and, I, uh, no, no, it was, uh, Dan Quayle got upset about it. Oh, Quayle? It. Yeah, he, he Think, called him out for, because Can, there was a plot line where Candace Bergen, uh, had a child without marrying the father. And yes, she was just going to raise a career minded right. mother. Right. And Dan Quayle pointed to her as a bad example. And there, it, it just <laughs> just That's exploded. Him. You know that just blew up like a monkey flinging poo, and yeah, it would, yeah, it I, would seem so quaint nowadays. I, uh, I know. Since in the series, she was a successful. I want to say, was she an on-air anchor? Yes, she was. Yeah, so we're talking about well, very well-paid, um, you know, uh, anchor woman sure. with a career who wanted to also be a mother. Right. Um, and I, it was a good series. I don't say I've a ton of them, but I definitely watched it when it was on. Um, and they had a lot of uh, you know, funny, semi-serious, you know, kind of sitcom slash drama. I yeah, just don't I, know if you can I bring it back thirty years later. That's yeah. I crazy. highly recommend if you can find it. Uh, watching the episode with Wallace Shawn as the newly elected congressman who finds out whose money funded his way into office, and he has to get up and then say things that they want him to say. <laughs> Surely you're not advocating the return of slavery. Apparently, I am. (laughs) (laughs) It's it's just it's hysterical because he doesn't believe any of that stuff. He just wanted to be congressman, and Mm -hmm. and so now he's he's gotta he's gotta say all these uh, uh, terrific. However, that's great as a memory. I don't see why it needs to come back any more than I see why Will and Grace needed to come back. Exactly. Or, or why uh, Roseanne come, needs to come or back. Or Roseanne. There you go. It seems to be the trend now. It's like, boy, let's not even bother retreading one of these things. Let's just put it right back on. Same story, same ideas. Back, you know, num, They're hitting no that thanks. Gen X nostalgia really hard, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah. I tried to just, watch Frasier, and it's awful. <laughs> <laughs> like I, I my, my parents it, liked Frasier. I remember I remember it being a thing when I was young, like on TV, and I like a year yeah. ago I tried to watch some episodes, and I'm like, this is not made for me. This is this is not my <laughs> no. sensibility. It's, it's a different time. I was like, is this like a? It's a period drama, maybe you know. <laughs> <laughs> but um, something for the olds. <laughs> I, I will never live that down. So. Uh, so that's something that's getting a new life. How about something that's uh, dying? A while ago, Fitbit bought. Uh, oh, do you guys remember the uh, the Pebble smartwatch? I it do. Was like At the time, the... it was the biggest Kickstarter fundraiser in history. Yeah, d- um, ten million or something plus for the first Model One. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, amazing stuff. Like, really, like put Kickstarter on the map too. I, I think, but like Fitbit bought them out. I think what a couple couple years ago. And, That's amazing, uh, right? Because Fitbit's going to support the whole line. So now all those Pebble of uh, fans finally have a big corporate backing to make sure this product moves into the future. Is that what you're about to tell me, right? Yeah, that's uh, right. No way this story can end badly. <laughs> uh, Fitbit is finally ending support of those original devices in June. No. Uh, and the thing, I understand, I mean, there are a lot of companies that buy intellectual property and because they want some weird software aspect, right? But then these devices that we have, like, I mean, I have, like, my house is full of Hue lights and Nest thermostats, and I have Sonos <laughs> sound bars. You know, like, there are all these interconnected things. And, you know, it is just kind of a gamble because it's like, when's the next buyout? Because somebody wants some aspect of the software for their main line, and they eventually in support for the device that you might have spent a lot of money on, you know? Uh, yeah. look, look, and look, I still look, think uh, you're being generous because sometimes. The bigger company doesn't want anything except to shut down a competitor. And yeah, True. and that's that's another thing too. And it's, True. it's like, but it's it's hard for me to get really worked up about this because you know you're looking at a guy who's had to replace his video collection twice. Yeah, uh, you know because we thought VHS was it, man. We thought that was it, and now then it went on to discs, DVDs, and Blu-rays. Well, and now as you're starting to have to buy it all digitally. So that it's stored online or on your computer. So many copies. 
Yeah, I know. I know. I can watch Casino Royale any time I want. <laughs> but uh, there's, I mean, heck, even our, even my phone, for heaven's sake. I mean, 10 years ago, I just barely had a, a BlackBerry. Uh, and then I had to switch over to an iPhone. Mm-hmm. And, you know, those keep changing. And, you know, every time I get upset, it's like, you're making it bigger. I don't want it bigger. Mm-hmm. Well, now my eyes are going bad. It's like, you're making them too small. <laughs> <laughs> I had that experience. I want it bigger. <laughs> Give it to me <laughs> bigger. Make it go into my big wraparound sunglass <laughs> eye shades. <laughs> I want to do VR on that. Uh, truth. So I I do feel bad about, uh, you know, a popular Kickstarter that people supported and a company that was doing something that was really kind of cutting edge. Yeah. Uh, their big claim to fame is that they got there first. Yeah. Everybody at the time was talking about <laughs> smartwatches with, with Microsoft, Apple, and I think Samsung. But before any of those companies had a product out, Pebble had a working product out. And yeah, it, it didn't have popular. all the bells and whistles, but it worked. Yeah, but hands, handspring product. visor and Palm Pilot got to you know the digital assistant first. Yeah, and, that's true. But then Apple comes along, puts it all into one phone with better stuff. And sorry, handspring, sorry Palm, you know you guys are out of sorry BlackBerry. Yeah. So these things are you know just part of how how. Uh, uh, technology is completely outpacing me and my ability to keep up with it. <laughs> and my wallet. I mean, they, they are I offering mean, a credit to like a fifty dollars credit if you can provide like proof of purchase for your Pebble for like one of the newer. Oh sure, Fitbit. yeah, that's so kind. Yeah, that's right. If you can't, right? Like anybody keeps the receipt for that long, but I mean, my God, it's getting so that you can even buy your drugs online. You know, yeah. you don't, you don't even, if you want your fentanyl, all you got to do is oh, Google no. fentanyl for sale. So you would think that, you know, the, the feds are right behind them, right? No, they have evidently just learned that you can use Google to find drug dealers. <laughs> that still it's shocks funny. me it's because we're funny. talking about the super, you know, super potent, highly deadly opioid. Yeah. It's, and yeah. and then, like what the article said is like, you Google it. You pay with bitcoins, and USPS delivers it. I yeah, like. which, yeah, well, and they don't deliver all of it. I mean, I've watched the Border Patrol TV show. Some of it gets found. Good, you know, probably not all of it, <laughs> but you know, they're but they're shipping it in in the craziest ways. I mean, it's just uh, smuggling that stuff in. That's the weak link right there is the the smuggling end of it because it can get found and and caught. But still, $766 million worth of this stuff, they turned up just by doing a Google search for fentanyl for sale and finding dealers in China who will take your Bitcoin and send it to your your house. That's just – that's mind-boggling. Yeah. Uh, And – I got to I got to wonder how much of the the end of, you know, cryptocurrency this spells because I mean it how long has it been around? It didn't take long for it to be proven that it's only going to be used for that it's going to be used mostly for illegal purposes. You know, that mm. the, an anonymous currency like that, I uh, I don't know. Yeah, yeah, the joke is though, well, I'll get into it some other day. Uh, bitcoins are not anonymous. That's the weird part. That everyone <laughs> has a full history of every transaction. <laughs> And that's that's how that's built. So, so they have to gonna... make special arrangements to anonymize it, you know, by by hashing it together with a bunch of other transactions. And yeah, you know, like, I, I don't know. I, I never get into that stuff. I, I read some of the forums that the boosters are crazy. Sure. Like you'd think it was literally, you know, some combination of Jesus Christ and sliced bread. <laughs> I, um, I know exactly what you mean. That that in, I'm into enthusiasm for things. And, and there seems to be a new one every other week, like Ethereum, and they have a garlic coin. Garlic coin? I mean, come on. <laughs> I bought Doge, Dogecoin a few yeah. years ago, and that such, one just such value, such much value. wow, wow. I and I that one like I need to figure out how to like get into the wallet because like because of the boom in that like even the joke currencies like it's worth something. It, like capped up to like like it, it got to like two billion dollars or something like. Mm. 
like collectively it was just crazy because people have still like just any any currency the because now they're speculating like futures contracts on it like for like wall street stuff which yeah. is exactly what they were trying to avoid by having yeah. these decentralized currencies yeah, um, i'm sure so. that's not a bubble right yeah yeah, yeah that's right there's yeah. no way that can go wrong well, listen, we are half an hour in, oh which is when we would usually wrap this thing up and head on over to Problem With Your Face Land, but we're going strong. we got several weeks of stuff behind us, so let us move into trashing some trailers. Get up. This will make for one epic trailer. So I've been seeing a lot of movies thanks to my movie pass. That's uh, cool. Yeah. Oh, it's been so much fun. It's it's so great. But I've seen some trailers that are for movies that I probably would never go see, but they really struck a, a, a chord with me. That I went to see The Post, right, with uh, Tom Hanks, Meryl Streep, uh, yes. Freedom of the Press opus uh, by none other than West Side Story director Steven Spielberg. <laughs> and, <laughs> And, you know, here it is, it's espousing freedom of the press and fighting for our rights and things like this, you know, the ordinary citizen and, you know, putting the lid on the government. The trailers before it, there were two. One was for a movie called 12 Strong, which stars Chris Hemsworth and a bunch of other buff-looking dudes. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. As the Afghan horse soldiers, a team of American special forces soldiers who went into Afghanistan right after 9-11 and took the war to the Taliban. Uh, and so it's full of heroic rides and explosions and, you know, men being noble and let's do this and things like that. Then there's uh, the movie The 1517 to Paris, which is about... Uh, the train hijacking in Europe in 2015 that was foiled by three American soldiers who were on leave that jumped the uh, the terrorists and stopped the thing. And, of course, that injury to themselves, they, they saved everybody. Yeah, I remember that was a crazy news day, man. They oh, got man. The, the keys of the city. I remember my, <laughs> my mother, my, my, my senior citizen mother, Tell me on the phone. I don't know if those young men are single, but they can have as much sex in Paris as they want tonight. <laughs> sassy, sassy mom. Uh, well, I'm not sure that's going to come through in the movie, which is directed by Clint Eastwood and stars the actual guys who did it. Huh. This movie actually features the soldiers as themselves recreating what happened. In a fictionalized version of mm. uh, of their story, that could go terribly, terribly wrong. It's an interesting. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree, but so I Remember don't think Battleship, that, that, <laughs> that opus, because that had a lot of real veterans in it, and God bless the, those men, but they, they did they weren't they actors. were not they were not actors exactly so right super stiff super unemotive yeah yeah so anyway my point is that I got to juxtaposing the post. With these two movies about American military heroes, with true, so it's two true stories. It's true stories on both sides. You know, you got the Pentagon Papers on one side, and you got these war fighters on the other. And I don't know. I mean, you would think of it as as of these war movies as being patriotic. I tend to think they're more nationalistic mm -hmm. than patriotic. That they're, they're trying to make you feel you know, proud to be an American. Yeah. Uh, whereas the post is trying to be more patriotic in that it is showing the rights of the people being, you know, fighting to get them and define what they are, as opposed to look at how badass we Americans are and we're going to stop the bad guys. I don't know. Any thoughts on that? Have you guys seen either of these, tra any of these trailers? I have seen both trailers that you talked about. Yeah. Um, 12 Strong just seemed, <laughs> it's not my thing, man. No. Um, <laughs> I, no. I'm always a little leery of overly jingoistic um, military stuff. Right, yeah. Yes. Um, uh, if it's if it's fictional, or enough time has passed, they can they can show another side to the story. So they can show a little bit more of the you know things weren't all you know puppy dogs and butterflies. Um, but but so once you begin beating that uh, Star Spangled Drum, um, they they can't do that. So you get, kind of get this unreflective portrayal, and I'm just I don't know, man. Right, and and I don't. I've see... seen more dark sides in a superhero than in a movie than you'll see in, oh, in yeah. these type of movies. Yeah, exactly, and and I'm, 
I'm kind of curious as to what it is that's happening in our country now that requires these kinds of movies that makes them, uh, I don't know, maybe it's, uh, maybe it's, I, I, I really don't know. Normally in times of national strife, when we're up against an enemy from outside is when you see things like this. And yeah, I, yeah, that's, that could be it too. I don't know. We could talk about it. Maybe that problem with your face. Um, yeah. I think in part, if I do a one sentence summary of my feelings, is you can't tell people you should feel rotten and terrible about yourself and your country nonstop. You, you can't yeah, do well, that. Well, that's true. That's they're, true. They're going to rebel and say, I don't feel terrible about myself. I don't feel terrible about my country. So the, the counterbalance that someone comes along and says, well, you know, let me give you some really good reasons to be especially proud mm. to stand up and, and to, you know, to feel good, even if it's just for a two hour movie. Good point. Um, good so. point. I don't yeah. know. I I I I'll, I can get into it later too, but I, I think a lot of it is there's a lot of there's a lot of like media backlash to some of the progressivism that's been shown in other ways, like just like in media or in the the perception of the national discourse uh, for certain yep. subsets of people. And I wonder if that has something to do this this preponderance of particularly nationalistic movies has something to do with um i mean look at the media that they're bringing back that we just talked about right like all of these shows from like the the mm. 80s early 90s that probably are a lot of like maybe maybe someone's the, the 50s used to be like the good old days for a certain subset of the generation and now it's like oh, right, how about right. those those high and mighty 80s you know yeah like, yeah yeah when yeah. we were that still blows high. my mind though because I was, that was when I was a kid. I mean, I graduated in 1988, and I, we, we weren't doing day trading stocks or whatever. It wasn't good old days, right? No, and, and no, a lot of people I knew wasn't. it was super high interest rates. Um, uh, that was a recession. There was a recession going on. Yeah, and, and constant threat of thermonuclear war. Yep. But didn't you the, have the, Reagan? Did people not remember that in the 80s? I specifically I, yes, remember. Yes, we it. absolutely did have Reagan, and that's what was going on. Yeah, was, I, I know. It, it's just yeah. it, it's just something to – it's interesting that I think there's some interplay there too. But yeah, I sure. totally agree with you. and That's why it always disturbs me when, when people refer back to the, the, the grand old 80s. And I'm like, well, I, <laughs> I was there. No, it wasn't all that yeah, good. Uh, for people my age, uh, it's the, the 90s are like the when we were kids. And it's like, oh, yeah, the 90s, so nostalgic. How about all that heroin, you know? But of course, <laughs> now we have an opioid crisis, so <laughs> – So heroin is back, you know? Yep. So from the trailers, we go to overdue reviews. But I got a confession to make, you guys. Uh, One of my uh, little personal uh, projects this this January was I went dry January as far as streaming movies and services. I don't Mm – I'm not watching anything unless somebody else in my family is watching too. So that I'm not sitting there at my computer watching a bunch of movies all day instead of getting stuff done. That's how I got to write my novel. That's how I got <laughs> to finish it. I didn't have anything else to do except write it if oh, I wanted to cool. entertain myself. So it's been a very successful experiment, but I also don't have an overdue review. Sorry. Sorry. Does anybody else? Anybody else see it? But I do. Yep. Oh, you did? What? What? What, what did you see, Steve? This is your review. Well, you're late. So it was on cable again. I, I've seen it before, but it was on cable the other week. It's called Inside Man. It came out in 2006. Oh, I it stars, love that movie. Yeah, Denzel Washington, Clive Owen, Jodie Foster, Christopher Plummer, among others. Yeah. Um, it, it's basically a bank heist, but that doesn't really do it justice. No. Um, it, it's one of the few bank heist movies in which I, as someone who's not a bank heister, <laughs> believes <laughs> that they could get away with it. Like the plot... The scheme they come up with seems just um, plausible enough right. that you actually believe they could get away with it. And yeah. then to, they keep adding mystery to mystery, like they're not really there for the money. Right. And there's a specific, you know, subplot going on. And then you find, um, you know, Christopher Plummer is the man who owns the bank, and he hires this fixer, played by Jodie Foster, to deal directly with uh, um, the bank robbers because of something you know um i don't want to spoil it but yeah love the movie i love the characters i love the, the way they add depth to the plot where it's not just about you know robbing a bank getting away and flying to cuba or whatever with your ill-gotten gains and jodie foster's character is one of my all-time favorite characters she's barely in the movie 
I don't know how much huh. she has like, you know, 15, 20 minutes of screen time total in this, you know, movie. Yeah. Um, but I love that character of the fixer who she mostly deals with. I mean, she, she gets a paycheck, but she mostly deals with favors. And so she'll take care of this problem on behalf of the bank owner. But she says, but we need your name to uh, um, endorse this. Uh, what does she say? Like a condo application for his right. Laden's brother. Nephew. His nephew. Nephew. Yeah. And, and he can't <laughs> refuse. And there's another scene in which she's talking to the mayor. And she's pulling in a favor. The mayor's like, you told me this is the last time. She goes, so this will be the last favor you owe me. And so like, she, she, she deals in favors between the most powerful people in the city. Yeah. And um, that's, that's, that's pretty awesome. It is very awesome. And of course, it's played by Jodie Foster. So right. she has that ability right. to play this very cool, calculated, but smiling, pleasant um, character who you know who you know is, is managing this kind of um, social chaos underneath. Uh, anyways, I've tried to play that character in several tabletop role playing games. Uh, it's one that I'm very fascinated in because it's so different than my real life. <laughs> um, so I, I, the whole movie's full of great characters. She specifically is one of them. So yeah, yeah. Chiwetel Ejiofor plays uh, Denzel Washington's partner, and he's he's great. Yes. Uh, yeah. It's 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 a really great bank heist movie. So I'll so. say that there's one uh, kind of negative. Um, you have to pay attention to the ending very carefully. Oh, it's they true. Kind of the, the denouement where they kind of reveal well, he gets this and goes to them and talks to her and he, you know, talks to him and they think he has this but he doesn't or whatever. It's played quickly just to wrap up the plot. But but I'm telling you, like I've seen the movie multiple times. It is still a little confusing to figure out. Like, why did he say that? Do they think he has it? Does he really have it? Who has that thing? Right, right. Um, it's, it's not entirely clear, so. Yeah, yeah, but it, it's still, it's totally worth the watch. I mean, yeah. it's just, it's it's so good. So how about you, Madison? Any budget bin games for us? Big fun. Small price. I do. This is one that I've had in my queue to play for like two years, and I finally <laughs> uh, had time to sit down and do it. It's called Monument Valley. It is a ambient perspective puzzle game. It is... I have no idea what that means. <laughs> well, I would be happy to tell you in great detail. So, basically, you know uh, M.C. Escher drawings? Yeah, like sure. The, the perspective? It's that, but it's a game. So, oh. Yeah, it's okay. really cool. So, you the should, way... You should have just said. <laughs> it's an M.C. Escher... Okay, so, Monument Valley. It's a, it's a perspective M.C. Escher game. And uh, oh, you, awesome. you navigate these impossible structures uh, with the main character, uh, Ida, who's a, a silent thieving princess. And uh, you get her from point A to point B, but you have to solve the puzzles by rotating the structure so that the perspectives lines up or rotating oh, parts wow. of the structure uh, so that uh, different areas are revealed um, and she can proceed. Uh, it's very cool, very addicting gameplay. And it does a – you buy it, buy it. It's so good. Play it. Really, it's on uh, iOS and Android. It's great. So the cool thing is that uh, it doesn't have tutorials. It has beautiful music. It's the the people that developed it, uh, us two studios. They really made emphasis. They wanted any any screen cap that you took of the whole game. They wanted each thing, each frame, to be worthy to be hung as art in your house. <laughs> so it's gorgeous. Wow. But the really cool thing is there. There's no tutorial. It just gets you started right off the bat. And the gameplay is so intuitive and so clear and the levels scale up in difficulty and length uh so appropriately based on the skills that you learn each time uh it's really satisfying to play i'm about i'm on like level seven now i think and the the base game has 10 and there's an expansion for it as well but um it's not necessarily a short game because the the puzzles do extend it depends on like how much time you want to spend with it but it's really soothing to um to play but you have to think too it's it's just it's so good uh again the art is gorgeous well that's just great i boost my productivity <laughs> by giving up tv and movies and video games and you come back with something that's right up my alley that's oh, just that's right. not right oh, it's, oh, it's so good it's so good i mean and like the and some of the structures are literally like that that waterfall kind of structure um that's like in one of the famous mc escher paintings and actually a few years ago uh, they had an mc escher um uh gallery touring or art show touring uh in in my city so we went and like this on, is... on an on an infinite loop right yeah <laughs> 
Uh, and so we, we, it was just, uh, I got to see some of like the original like wood blocks and stuff. It's just really cool. But yeah, if you like any of that MC Eshery kind of force perspective or impossible structures, uh, you're going to love this. And it's just really, really cool. It's just, uh, it's a few bucks on, on your phone. Play it with the sound on if you can and, uh, enjoy it. I just, I really like it. This is like a, a, like A plus must buy if you can. And it's appropriate oh, for all cool. ages, and it's solvable for um, even younger children if if they're trying to like think about the puzzles that way. But it's still good for adults too. So, excellent, cool. Well, Steve, uh, you usurped my role with the with the uh, overdue review. So, for what weird anime, I'm going to let you take that too. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Steve is a anime. What weird anime is Steve watching this week? I, I watched a series called The Ancient Magus Bride. Uh, Magus kind of be like the magician. Mm-hmm. And um, I picked it because it was well, the graphics are beautiful, the animation style. And uh, it's very, especially in the beginning, very much like Studio Ghibli work. They, they try to do this kind of naturalistic person in nature. It's like a young girl exploring... The, the city and then, you know, the forest outside the city and then the uh, a little library she finds in the forest full of magical creatures. The the problem with it is because it's kind of this, you know, slower pace, it's very slow. Like, very little happens. Um, you kind of have pay, have to have patience for the first uh, two or three. I guess they have, I don't know exactly how it works. So I'm watching it on Crunchyroll and kind of like one series is just three very long episodes. So I don't know if that's like OVA content, you know, outside the the mean, but and then they also have like a thirteen episode normal twenty four minute episode of series. So I, mean, I, I don't know exactly how what order they were released in or whatever. Um, I watched the the three special ones first. It kind of gives you the background story for the main character, and then um, the thirteen episode series you know progresses. And they don't they didn't really explain everything that goes on. Mm-hmm. Um, but long story short, she's uh, it's a modern day, which is important because it feels like early nineteenth century maybe even early 18th century setting but it's not it's modern day and um, she can see the spirit world and fake creatures and they're aware of her and they're drawn to her and it causes tons and tons of problems um, her father takes her brother and just um, abandons them then you find out later that's not perhaps what exactly happened and then her mother commits suicide right in front of her which is tragic oh. and, and so she's an orphan and then she's passed around from one relative to another they don't want to put her in an orphanage because it would look bad on the family, but nobody wants to keep her because she's weird and creepy, because she's constantly <laughs> interacting with invisible spirit creatures. And so um, she has a very hard time, um, I, I guess, in an act of desperation, which happens off screen, which is weird. Um, she's about to commit suicide. So she's on the roof of her school, and she's going to fling herself off or something. And she's approached by this weird you know, dude who's like, um, if you don't care about your life, why don't you sell it to someone who does? And so she signs a contract and agrees to be sold. Okay, I'm like, how does this work? That sounds, you know, sketchy. <laughs> he then yeah. leads her to this magical auction house, and the person who takes a bid on her is this ancient Magus. Um, and he's so cool looking. His name is Elias. And um, it's a very, very tall, like, British gentleman with a pocket watch and a, and a vest and a suit. Okay. Um, but his head is, is like a... Um, uh, steers skull, huh? Just the bone skull, and, and it gave me the kind of vibe of um, like Black Beard or like a Bluebeard's Bride, or you know, like you know, married to the giant or something, where it's this um, young vulnerable girl married to this kind of um, you know, older, darker oh, you know, presence. Yeah. But he turns out to not really be that dark. He actually cares for her quite a bit. But he declares right off the bat, he's like, um, "You're going to be my apprentice. I'm going to teach you how to perform magic, and then we're going to get married." And she's like, huh? <laughs> yeah, um, totally normal. Yeah. Um, uh, but when you watch it, it's very, it, it's, you know, there's no sexual content. Okay. Um, he, they explain why he's interested in her, what's special about her, and why he's actually tr- to teach her magic to save her life or whatever. Super interesting. I really like the characters. I really like the setting. I really, really like the relationship. It feels so much like a fairy tale. It really does. And again, you can easily forget because they when, when she's living on his estate... It feels like something in the early 1800s, but then they'll go to they'll go to town. It'll be them taking a modern electric train to 
London. It is, it's right now. It just doesn't feel that way. So if you get past the kind of very slow early episodes, it's a wonderful story. Again, it's called The Ancient Magus Bride. Excellent. Here. Well, I think that that will have to wrap up our extra giant sized <laughs> edition of All in the Reflexes. I hope that you will uh, hop on over and follow us to There's a Problem with Your Face. We've got a lot more Patreon supporters than we used to, and so that that community is growing, and you too could be a part of it. Tell them how, Steve. Uh, first, uh, track out our website, aitrpodcast.com. It links uh, to everything we mentioned in the show notes. Also links to our social media, which is Twitter and Facebook, and Patreon. Links you right over there, and for as little as a dollar a month, you get twice the content. Um, and again, the stuff that we post over on uh, Patreon, the, there's a problem with your face, you know, sister episode, is um, usually the same topics, sometimes more topics, different topics, um, but usually unfiltered. So we were free to say whatever we want. It's it's marked not safe for work. Um, we don't we don't always cuss and swear, <laughs> but we could. <laughs> but we could. <laughs> oh, um, and sometimes tease. we even get into kind of risque, you know, topics that are you know beyond. <laughs> So I hope that you will. I hope that you will come on over there and and check that out and see what we are we are going to talk about this week on There's a Problem with Your Face. Until then, I am Jeb Brack. I'm Madison Matricula Roberts, and this is Tech Guy Steve. And we'll talk to you next time. <laughs>